So everyone knows about this company, Google. Some of you might have heard about this project, which Google announced last December 2004, called Google Print, and that they renamed in November 2005 the Google Book Search Project. What the Google Book Search Project imagines that it will do is to enable people to search inside books. Not search inside books the way Amazon allows you to, for after all, the Amazon project itself is trademarked as search inside project, but instead search inside as in Googleize books. They imagine to take books and to make it possible for people to see inside those works. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, there are three categories of books that we can imagine Google to be Googleizing. If you take the 18 million books in the project which Google originally sought to scan, 9% of those books are books that are copyrighted and still in print. 16% of those books are books that are in the public domain, meaning books whose copyright has expired. And that means that 75% of the 18 million books that Google originally intended to copy, and then index, are books that are under copyright in the United States, but out of print. So what the Google Book Search Project imagines it will do is to first scan everything, and then second, grant access to these books differentially, meaning depending upon the status of the book, grant different access. And so there are three kinds of access Google intends to grant. For the books that are in the public domain, Google will grant full access to the book. To the books that are in copyright, Google will grant at least snippet access to the book. And for books that are in copyright and in print, meaning books with whom there's a publisher or a copyright owner to negotiate, Google will grant as much access as the publishers and authors allow. So here's an example taken from Google's own web page. If you do a search within the Google Book Search project for Holmes, you pull together a bunch of books that are available about Justice Holmes. If the book is in the public domain, then you can see the full contents of the book, as this book, The Writings of Oliver Wendell Holmes, by Oliver Wendell Holmes, are in the public domain. Uh, So that book is accessible fully through the Google Book Search project. But if the book is in copyright and in print, Then you get as much access as the publisher allows. So this book, The Essential Holmes, Selection from the Letters, Speeches, Judicial Opinions, and Other Writings of Justice Holmes, edited by Judge Richard Posner, has been granted a kind of initial snippet access so that you can search, for example, for the word economics within this book, and you can see that there are six different places where the word economics appears. And then if you click on each of these links, you are given access to the word economics in context, and you can read a couple pages around that word. Now, that access is determined by the publisher's own choice, and there's no argument about whether the publisher has the right to grant that access, as the author would have granted the publisher the right to secure that kind of marketing advantage. But the really important category that is at the center of the Google project is the access it will grant to works that are in copyright, but not necessarily still in print. And for these works, Google will at least secure snippet access. Now, what that means is, if you search on the book, as this example demonstrates from the book True Stories of Pioneer Life, a book that is in copyright, uh, but with whom there's no publisher to negotiate, then you will literally see little snippets of the work taken from the places where the words you've searched appear so that you can read just a couple words around each of those search uh, terms and nothing more. You can't read the rest of the book. If you try to access the book repeatedly, you will be blocked by the system. This is the minimal type of access that the Google Book Search Project grants. It's the access which the Google Book Search Project believes is protected by a doctrine called fair use. It is effectively an index, an index for the 21st century, granting extraordinary access to our cultural past. For the first time, we can look 
scan across the full range of published works within our libraries and begin to see something about the evolution and development of ideals because of this extraordinary access. And importantly, this access will be guaranteed for free. Google may eventually choose to sell advertisement around this access. Right now, they've promised they won't. But Google will make this access available in the way Google makes all of its searches available through free access to anyone who has access to the Internet. Now, of course, not everyone loves Google, or at least not everyone loves the Google Book Search Project. And in America, when you don't love something, you typically eventually get around to suing that thing you don't love. And that's happened in this case, too. So in September 2005, the Authors Guild filed a lawsuit against Google. And in October 2005, five publishers, backed by the American Association of Publishers, filed a lawsuit against Google. These lawsuits claimed, quote, massive copyright infringement by Google, and they demanded that Google stop the project, which it had launched in December 2004. Now, what's the argument behind these lawsuits? Well, the argument was described by Pat Schroeder and Bob Barr, two former congressmen from the opposite sides of the aisle, Pat Schroeder, the current head of the American Association of Publishers, in an article published in the Washington Times with a somewhat frightening title, quote, Reigning in Google, frightening when coming from former congressmen, um, as an argument about the essence of copyright. As these two authors wrote, quote, Our laws say if you want to copy someone's work, you must get their permission, end quote. Now, that claim about the law, though coming from two lawmakers or former lawmakers, is just simply false. It is not the case that you have to get permission every time you copy someone else's work. If that copying is, quote, fair use, then the law explicitly says you need no permission because, as the law says in 17 U.S.C. 107, quote, the fair use of a copyrighted work is not an infringement. So if the copying is a fair use, you need no permission from anyone. And so that's the question that Google Book faces. Is the book search project fair use? Well, in a debate at the New York Public Library, which I participated with uh, the general counsel of Google, David Drummond, and uh, against Alan Adler and Nick Taylor from the Authors Guild, um, we addressed this question of whether the Google Book Search Project is fair use. And the Authors Guild and the American Association of Publishers, represented at that event, um, said that it's not fair use for Google to scan these books and make them accessible. And so the question is, why? What's their argument? Well, Nick Taylor from the Authors Guild essentially argued this, quote, pro that they're profiting from authors' work. It's a very rich company, profiting from the work of authors. And that was the essence to his argument for why this use shouldn't be considered fair use. And Alan Adler from the American Association of Publishers made a very important emphasis on the fact that Google, quote, didn't ask for permission before they scanned these books. And that was it seemed, at the core of his argument for why this was not fair use. So what's the principle behind these two claims? Well, the principle is something is not fair use if you can either, one, profit from it without returning profits to the authors, or two, if you engage in that use without the permission of the authors. Is that true? Is that really what fair use is? Take, for example, this extraordinary book, Free Culture, written by me, Lawrence Lessig, and published by Penguin. This book is filled with, of course, brilliance, but it's also filled with quotes. Quotes from people whose work I make reference to, either to praise or to criticize that work. I have profited from being able to use these quotes in writing this book. I didn't ask permission for using these quotes in this book. I use them under the doctrine of fair use. So is my use not fair use because I profited from these quotes and I didn't ask permission? 
Well, under the principle of the Authors Guild and the American Association of Publishers, the answer to that question must be no. This is not fair use. But the critical point to recognize is that, is, is that if that's the principle, this represents a radical change in the doctrine of fair use. Fair use means and has always meant that people have the right to profit on other people's work so long as the use is fair. They're allowed to use the work without the permission of the original author so long as the use is fair. And so the fact that you've profited or that there isn't permission isn't itself a determinant of whether it's fair use. Instead, those two features of fair use have always been at the core of what fair use has allowed. So let's return then to the core question. Is Google Book Search fair use? Well, the argument that it's not has an echo from a case decided a number of years ago in the middle of the Internet boom, a case that was inspired by a technology produced by the company mp3.com. mp3.com produced a technology called the Beamit technology. The Beamit technology made it simple for people to get access to their CD collection. So if you put your CD in your computer, what the Beamit technology would do is recognize the CD and then give you access to that work anywhere you might be on the network. So you could give all of the CDs in your collection into the Beamit system, and the system would recognize all of the CDs. And then if you were at work, you could listen to your music. If you were at home, you could listen to your music. If you were uh, traveling, you could listen to your music. If you were a friend's house, you could listen to your music. The point is, all of this access was made possible through the Beamit service. And as you see from this sign-in screen, the Beamit service uh, protected the collection that it compiled by requiring that there be some password to assure that just uh, not just anyone could get access to that collection. So to prepare to make this service available, mp3.com copied about 50,000 CDs to servers so that when people put the CDs into their computers, the company would have a copy accessible so that they could grant access to the music once the identification had been made. Well, it took about a week for the major record labels to file a lawsuit against mp3.com, and they got the court to ask a fundamental question. Who authorized the original copy of those CDs? For even though mp3.com believed quite sensibly but they, that they were facilitating just a fair use of the CDs that a customer had purchased, a fair use by giving that person access to that CD wherever they were, a kind of space shifting of content that had been purchased by the consumer. In order to enable that fair use, mp3.com had to copy the contents of those 50,000 CDs onto the server. And it was that initial copy that puzzled and troubled the court. And of course, the answer to the question, who authorized the original copy, is no one. No one authorized the original copy because mp3.com thought the original copy was protected by the doctrine of fair use because the ultimate use allowed for that content was consistent with the doctrine of fair use. Well, the court disagreed with mp3.com. They said that that original copy was not justified by fair use, and they therefore issued damages against mp3.com in the amount of $110 million dollars which was an amount that eventually forced the company into an effective bankruptcy. Now, that's the same question that's being asked in the context of Google Print. For who authorizes the original copy, at least of those books that are in copyright and with which there is no agreement, and the answer again is no one has authorized that original copy. And so if the principle of the mp3.com case continues, namely that even though the ultimate use might be a fair use, the original copy itself is not protected, if that's the principle that applies, then the Authors Guild and the American Association of Publishers believe they have a strong case to say that Google is not protected by fair use. But it's my view that Google is protected by fair use, and the argument that suggests that they are really comes in two different parts. 
The first part builds upon another important case decided recently in uh, the Ninth Circuit, a case called Kelly versus Arebasoft Corporation. What the Kelly case involved was a practice that's become increasingly common on the Internet of search engines taking thumbnail images of copyrighted content that exists on the Internet and giving people access to those images through some simple search interface. So here's a picture of Google Images, which does essentially the same thing that the Arebasoft case described. You can see that in this picture there are thumbnail versions of images that exist on other websites. And if you clicked one of these thumbnail images, you would be taken to that other website and given the opportunity to see the full image on that other website. There was no effort to copy the original image and store that under either the Rebusoft case or in the Google case. Instead, this is simply a way to grant an index into images that are available elsewhere. Now, the court said what happened in this case is that the original copyrighted work had been reduced so as to link to an image, a thumbnail image linked to the original image. So there was a transformation of the original copyrighted work by transforming it into a thumbnail. That thumbnail itself wasn't a substitution for the original copyrighted work, the quality of the thumbnail is so poor, no one would ever use that instead of the original copyrighted work. And all that the transformative work did was give you access to the original copyrighted work in a way that protected and advanced the interests of the underlying copyright owner. And that's what grounded the claim for fair use, which the Arebasoft case ultimately held, uh, protected the practice in that particular case. And so, too, could you argue, is what Google here protected, doing protected by fair use. Because what Google is doing here is also producing a transformation of the original copyrighted work. That transformation produces a reduced image, in some sense, of the original uh, copyrighted work. So, again, here are the snippets that Google displays as a way to give you access to the original copyrighted work, once you see this reduced quality image, then you have the opportunity to link back to the original copyrighted work in a way that drives you to that original work. The difference, of course, is that the work here is not on the computer because we're indexing books in physical space, whereas the works in the Arebasoft case we're on a computer somewhere. You could see the original work on the computer. But the principle that unites the two cases is that the transformation produces a reduced version of the original copyrighted work, itself not a substitute for the original work, but instead providing an advanced index or access to the original copyrighted work in a way that actually adds value back to the original copyrighted work. That principle in both cases drives the conclusion that there should be fair use in both cases. So this link to books is just like the link to images in the Arebasoft case. But the second reason that I think this case clearly falls under the fair use doctrine is much more practical, a consideration that's often extremely hard to enter into in the context of the law, because the law's structure does not easily admit what everyone else in the world takes as obvious. Section 107 of the uh, uh, Copyright Code, which protects and regulates the right of fair use, basically sets out four considerations that courts are to look to in deciding whether a particular use should be considered a fair use. And they ask that you look to the nature um, of the work and the nature of the use and the amount of the use uh, of the work that you're going to use and the potential effect on markets that are involved in the use that you are making. And those markets are both the actual markets that exist and the potential markets that exist. So if your use is actually harming the existing original market, then it's less likely your use will be found to be fair use. 
Um, and if it's harming what is reasonably thought to be a potential market, then your use is less likely to be found to be a fair use. Now, the Authors Guild and the American Association of Publishers at the New York Public Library debate um, admitted that they weren't losing any money because of what Google Print was doing. Instead, they were complaining because they were not going to be profiting from anything that Google Print did. So what they demanded was a piece of the pie, a pie that Google uh, would itself be baking, and their claim is that the law of copyright gives them a demand to get a piece of the value that Google produces through Google's innovation. Um, and so, of course, they say that they could themselves engage in this practice of making this content available, and that itself would constitute a potential market, and therefore Google is threatening that potential market. Now, this claim makes some sense with respect to one particular portion of the universe of books that Google Print is scanning. That's the portion of works that are in copyright and still in print. What I said was about 9% of the total number of books that Google intended to scan. And you might say that maybe that's understating the number a bit, because even if a book is now out of print, maybe it's recent enough that we could know something about the original author. So we could say that that number is maybe a little bit beyond 9%, maybe 9 to 15%. But the point is, regardless of how liberal we are with that estimation, it still is a tiny fraction of the total number of books that Google has promised to scan and make available to the world for free. So it's possible with respect to those, and the fact is Google is engaging in negotiations with those types of works. Remember this image from the examples that I gave before of Google Print's project as it relates to works that are in print and in copyright. In that context, Google is negotiating with the very same publishers who are suing Google right now to grant an access as broad as the publishers will allow. So with respect to the works where there is actually an opportunity to engage in some kind of market transaction, Google is engaging in a market transaction to grant access beyond the minimal access that the snippets search would provide. But with respect to the works that are in copyright and out of print, it's just not the case that it's possible to engage in the traditional market transaction to ask permission before you included those works within the Google search engine. You can't do this because the, quote, property involved here, copyright, happens to be the most inefficient property system ever composed by man. This system was not designed to make it easy for us to go back and find old copyright owners because we have no way to know who those copyright owners are because the system doesn't require that that data be kept. So copyright in the United States right now reaches back to 1923. Any work from 1923 on could be copyrighted, depending upon how the copyright was preserved, could be uh, depending upon whether it was registered initially, um, but then that question is, do we even know which works are registered and which works which were registered were renewed? Most sensible think people think there must be a list out there of whose works are copyrighted or which works remain protected by the law. But of course, the reality is there is no list. There is no list of copyright owners. There is no list of what works are under copyright. There is no simple way to know who owns what properly. And if there's no simple way to know who owns what property, there's no way to ask permission before one uses that property. If you can't know who owns what, then you can't ask permission. And if permission is necessary, that means this Google project is impossible. And then you might begin to ask, if you can't build a market here, then why shouldn't this be considered fair use? The market depends upon being able to engage in a market transaction, which means identifying the property owner and asking that person for permission. But in this market, 
the property system is so inefficient that there's no possible way to engage in that market transaction. And that's exactly the sort of reason that should justify the conclusion that the use Google wants to make for this work is simply protected by fair use. And if it's not protected by fair use, then first it's absolutely clear that the Google book search project can't happen. And you might begin to wonder about Google itself. Because what Google is doing with books is exactly what Google does with the World Wide Web. Right now with the World Wide Web, Google copies as much of the web as it can, and it then builds an index on the basis of that copy. Google offers people to be excluded from that index, either by putting a little notice on their website or by asking Google explicitly to be removed from the index. Either way makes it simple for someone in the World Wide Web to be removed from the Google index if that's their preference. And this is exactly what Google has offered people with the Google Book Search Project. People in the Google Book Search Project are also allowed to exempt themselves from the Google Book Search Project. If you're an author and you don't want your work indexed in the Google Book Search Project, uh, you can inform Google, and Google will have that index altered to remove your work. So in both cases, Google is copying everything, offering authors an opt-out, and that is the structure of indexed access that they're offering. Now, if it's illegal to do it with respect to books, why is it legal to do it with respect to the web? And if, in fact, the Authors Guild and the American Association of Publishers are right with respect to books, then why isn't it follow that this project means that the indexes that Google and Yahoo and MSN and every other search engine produces are themselves illegal? Now, why should we care about this debate? This is just the latest in what I think of as a kind of IP extremism that is increasingly dominating policymakers' thoughts, especially in Washington today. It is the product of a struggle, a land grab that's going on as industries recognizing the perverse way that copyright law functions in the digital age attempt to exercise their power to protect themselves or to grab vast new spaces of profit. This kind of struggle, this kind of extremism, will have one important effect. It will stifle the development of new, innovative ways to access and spread our culture. This is a threat to Google, this particular case, and indeed, we might see this case as producing a threat from Google. For you might imagine what would it be like if, in fact, Google settled this case. For Google, of course, can't afford to pay whatever the Authors Guild or the American Association of Publishers would force them to pay to scan and grant access to these works. But practically no one else can pay in the same way. And so if Google were to settle and set a precedent to get a that to get access to these works and make them accessible in this way, you need to pay first or you need to suffer the extraordinary burden of clearing permissions first, then what that would do would mean only the few would be permitted to innovate in this extraordinary new field. Now this again is an example where intellectual property is dividing markets, not encouraging markets. It's stifling innovation, not encouraging innovation. It's doing so at least so long as you or we allow it to. So here's the choice the law presents us with. If we recognize the right of the authors or the publishers to demand that Google get permission before Google has the right to index and make accessible that index to our past. Then the authors and the publishers may get a few pennies for each work that's within their collection. But at least 50% of our past will be lost. 50% can't be within this index because there's no author or publisher to ask. 50% will be invisible 
to the world that looks to our past through the lens of digital technologies. That's the choice they forced us to make, and that's the choice that the law of fair use must reckon when it decides whether this use by Google is ultimately fair use under the law of copyright.